Good afternoon. My name is Eva Feldman, and I am the director of the Neural Network for Immersion Therapies. Today, we're very pleased to address with you our interest on the health impact of climate and environmental change. The World Health Organization has listed the 10 major threats to global health, and number one is air pollution and climate change. Now, what exactly is climate change and what causes climate change? Climate change simply refers to warming temperatures and changes in precipitation globally. And climate change is primarily due to the burning of oil and coal that emit noxious gases. Now, other contributing activities include deforestation, widespread agricultural farming, and the use of fertilizers. But what's important for us to know is that the rate of climate change is not natural and is really being brought on by us, the population. And what it is resulting in it is the loss of clean air, the loss of safe drinking water, the loss of safe shelter. And indeed, climate change probably costs minimally two trillion for the United States by the year 2100. And it's currently estimated that two to four million people will die of climate change in 2020. Now, what exactly are these individuals dying from? Well, here is more data from the World Health Organization looking at the percentage of annual deaths due to climate change and what causes them. And as you can see, indoor smoke from solid fuels, unsafe water, sanitation, poor hygiene, and urban outdoor air pollution are the three leading causes. But what's very interesting is these are the three leading causes, but they primarily occur in low and middle income countries, except for air pollution, which is highest in highly developed countries including our own. So today in this mini symposium, we will answer four questions. I will discuss what is impact climate change and air pollution has on Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Galtman will answer question two, how is the high prevalence of ALS in Michigan related to environmental pollution? Dr. Stuart Batterman will address question three, how do air pollution and climate change pose a threat to public health? And what are those threats? And finally, Dean Jonathan Overpeck will address question four. When faced with the growing threat of climate change, how do we turn these challenges into opportunities? So how does air pollution cause dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Well, importantly, there's direct entrance of particulate matter which is the matter in the air that is polluted and full of toxins, which Dr. Batterman will more fully address, but it directly enters through the nose into the brain because through the olfactory bulb, leading to brain inflammation, to the formation of plaques and tangles and loss of brain matter. And as you see here, there's a normal, here's a picture of a normal brain and here is a brain from an individual with Alzheimer's disease. I think it's clear the loss of cortical or gray matter in the brain. This is even better seen when looking at an MRI. So here's an MRI of a, of a sagittal, a coronal section of a brain of a person without dementia. And here is an MRI of an individual with Alzheimer's disease. All the black areas are simply void space. And here you can see what very little brain matter is left. Now there are several large studies that clearly show pollution links to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And I'm only going to, I'm only going to highlight three today. High air pollution in 63 very large regions of China was, was closely studied along with the population. And it was shown that there was a decrease of verbal and math ability 
by nearly 40% in persons over 70 who are exposed to high air pollution. And in a study from England of over 130,000 adults between the ages of 50 and 79 years old, those persons in England living in high air pollution areas had a 1.4 times higher risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease than those who did not. And finally, in a study by USC in California and Harvard of 998 women between the ages of 73 and 87, those individuals exposed to higher air pollution in the preceding three years had clearly more dementia and brain atrophy by MRI. Recently, the Lancet Commission published its annual report. And for the first time this year in August 2020, air pollution was listed as one of the 12 modifiable risks for dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which along with the other 11 factors, if addressed, could decrease the prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia by 40%. If you're interested in that commission report and hearing about the other 11 modifiable factors, please feel free to email me. I will now turn the floor over to my colleague, Dr. Stephen Goutman. Hi, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm gonna be speaking today about environmental pollution and the disease amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So what is ALS? ALS is a disease that affects the motor neuron cells in our brain. It causes those brain cells to die. There's no cure and unfortunately people with this disease die within two to four years. The disease leads to progressive weakness and so it leads to the loss of ability to move our arms and move our legs and breathe. And when we see people with ALS, they always wonder, why me? Why did I get this disease? And somebody that we follow in our center recently spoke to the Detroit Free Press and wondered the same thing. Wondered, what stacked the deck against me? Could it have been the hot summer days when I was swimming as a child in the polluted waters of the Huron River? Could it have been while we we're vacationing in Monterey, Mexico, and I was exposed to pesticides to kill termites, or it could have been chemicals in the food that I ate. And we really wonder these same questions. Not only that, we wonder why does ALS seem to be more prevalent in the Midwest and in the state of Michigan? We see that there are 5.7 per 100,000 cases of ALS in the Midwest, which is much higher than on the west side of the country where it's only 4.3 per 100,000 people. So we really want to understand why do we seem to be in an area that is more greatly affected by ALS and um, we're greatly thankful for the um, National ALS Registry who's really taking a, a stance at helping us understand these differences in rates of ALS across the country. So the first thing that we did to help us understand what are these risk factors that could be driving ALS is we asked participants who we follow in our center about their past occupation. And what we found is that individuals who worked in the armed forces were at twice the rate of developing ALS than those who had never served in the armed forces. And really importantly, we see that those individuals who reported an occupational exposure to pesticides were at five times the rate of having ALS compared to those who are not exposed to pesticides. So these are really interesting data to suggest that there is something going on that connects uh, exposures to disease. This past slide was on survey data, but we wanted to take this a step further and say, can we measure these pollutants, these chemicals in blood? And if so, what does it tell us? So we looked at some legacy pollutants. These are important because they tend to persist. They tend to build up in the, in the water, such as the Great Lakes, and then we get exposed to them. We looked at three major categories of, of these legacy pollutants that stay in our bodies for decades. 
the flame retardants in blue, things that are added to our furniture so that they don't burn. The PCBs, these are industrial materials in, in yellow. They're found in uh, some electrical equipment, for example, and pesticides in gray. And what you see here is a graph, and there's numbers at the bottom. Number one indicates that somebody who is, a, uh, who is living uh, with ALS is at no higher or lower risk of having disease. If the dot falls to the right of one, we see that we see that, that chemical is associated with a higher risk of having ALS. And if the dot falls to the left, we see that that chemical is inversely associated with a lower risk. So if we look at all these dots, all these different categories of pollutants, we see that they all tend to fall to the right of that one, meaning all of these chemicals uh, together in a combined way affect, uh, affect us and tend to cause an increase in our likelihood of, of having ALS. And when we combine all of these chemicals together and we say, let's look at the total amount of exposures, we see that there's a much higher risk of having ALS. We do this through what we call an environmental risk score, where we summate somebody's total amount of exposures. And we see if there's an individual who's at 25th percentile, so at the lowest part of having these pollutants in their body compared to somebody who's at the 75th percentile, their risk of having ALS is seven times higher. That's a really profound risk and not, use, not numbers that we're used to seeing. We wanted to take this a step further and say, what happens once these chemicals are in our bodies? We, we know that we know that pollution is associated with higher risk of ALS, but what happens when somebody already has ALS? And so we questioned, are these levels of pollutants associated with a shorter survival? In other words, somebody who has more of these chemicals in their body lives a shorter period of time. And on the right, you'll see a graph. This is what we call a survival curve. The whole population starts at one, meaning everybody is alive. And as the curves move to the right, that, that's as if time has gone by. And every time that curve drops, it indicates that somebody has unfortunately passed away. The curve on, in red, all the way on the right, are the groups of individuals who have the lowest amounts of these chemical exposures in their bodies. Whereas the group all the way to the left in yellow is the group with the highest amount of exposure. When we compare these groups, we see those individuals, those individuals in the highest category of exposure die at twice the rate of those in the lowest category of exposure. Therefore, what we're seeing here with our data is that there are clear occupational uh, risk factors for ALS, that we can measure these pollutants that increase one's susceptibility of having ALS, and these pollutants also are associated with a shorter survival time uh, of, for somebody having ALS. So now I'd like to hand the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Stuart Batterman. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here and speak to you for a few minutes about air quality and health. And to start off with, I'd like to refer to what we call the global burden of disease. This is an analysis which is performed each year and it estimates across the globe and breaks down by the region the morbidity and mortality of various diseases and risk factors. And on the left panel, I'm re-emphasizing what Dr. Feldman mentioned earlier, um, where air pollution is causing an estimated 6.8 million deaths per year. And much of that occurs from ambient air, but this Global burden of disease also breaks out indoor air, occupational settings, as well as environmental tobacco smoke or ETS. Now on the right side, we have a breakdown by disease type in this global burden of disease. And this is the number of deaths in thousands caused by these different pollutants. So you could see for ambient particulate matter, we have about 184,000 deaths per year from diabetes and kidney disease, uh, 633,000 from chronic respiratory disease, cardiovascular disease is the number one, and then we have some other categories, neoplasms, tuberculosis, and infections, and so forth. 
summing up to 1.4 million deaths per year, or about 5% of the world's mortality. You'll note, interestingly, on that past <laughs> little fast um, slide, that neurodegenerative diseases like ALS aren't even mentioned on this plot. So when we talk about air pollutants, it's convenient and helpful to break them down into four different categories. Most of the time, people are talking about what we call conventional pollutants. And in fact, the deaths that we've talked about on the previous slides are caused primarily by ozone and particulate matter. Now, there's many other pollutants, and those can be broken down into toxic pollutants that occur at local, regional, and global scale things like benzene or formaldehyde or diesel particulate matter. We have greenhouse pollutants, which are broken down into short, medium, and long-term uh, pollutants. And then recognizing that we spend 80 to 90% of our time indoors, we need to talk about indoor pollutants, which include off-gassing from building materials, uh, vapors coming in from different sources, pesticides that might be used indoors, as well as the penetration of outdoor pollutants to the indoor setting. So I'd like to show you one of our initiatives in trying to understand the scale and the influence of pollutant sources. And this is a short video showing our mobile pollution laboratory called MPAL as it completes a trip from Ann Arbor going down the highway into the Detroit area, into Southwest Detroit, measuring uh, about 100 different air quality parameters, which are mapped here, showing nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide. And this is just a display, but we do this to map out pollutants, as I'll show you um, in the next slide. So I've mentioned a couple different classes of pollutants. These occur at different scales. On the left panel, this is a map showing ozone levels over Michigan. The scale is about 300 miles across. Um, the red is the hot spots for Michigan um, on this particular day, exceeding the national standard. Uh, the circles are the monitoring network. Relatively good monitoring network for ozone uh, because this is a regional scale pollutant, the concentrations vary across the state, but they don't vary so much, say, from mile to mile. Now, in the second panel, we have a different pollutant. This is particulate matter under two and a half microns. This is small enough to get into your lungs all the way down uh, into the gas exchange area, and the exposure of this pollutant is what causes most of the deaths and most of the morbidity. Now, this map is showing in the brownish areas higher levels due to uh, mobile sources, trucks and buses and vehicles. And in the green areas, these tend to be the more residential. So we're able to actually map this uh, gradient from, say, highways to more residential areas. Now, the third panel shows a different type of source. This is SO2, sulfur dioxide which form some hot spots in the green and brownish areas, which are due to emissions largely from coal-fired combustion uh, and uh, uh, emissions coming from individual smokestacks. Now, it's interesting for um, and important that ozone, for example, is on the increase. We are being reclassified in Michigan as a moderate non-attainment area which means we do not meet the ozone standard. And we're also classified as a non-attainment area, not meeting the standards for SO2, in part because of these hotspots that you see here. Now, what we like to do is to understand the relationship between these pollutant sources, the emissions of the pollutants that come out, the way they move around in the environment, how people are exposed, how they get their dose, and the adverse health effect that that can cause. Now, climate change has a number of impacts on that cycle. First of all, with temperature changes, precipitation changes, extreme weather, um, and heat waves, we have changes in the emissions that are occurring from sources on the ground. We can see variation in, for example, foliage responding 
and plant growth and agriculture practices that may release more uh, uh, pesticides, for example, pollen may change, uh, the emissions from power plants to keep up with air conditioning needs may change. So we have a number of changes in the emissions. Those emissions then come into the atmosphere and because of the higher temperatures, the chemistry and the transport of these pollutants can also change. And this is clearly happening with respect to ozone. We see a very strong temperature dependence on ozone and uh, seasonality, which is well understood now. And this is one of the factors which is driving Michigan and other locations into non-attainment. Particulate matter can also be affected by uh, those changes as well. Okay. So some of the effects are diagrammed in this scheme. Uh, for example, I've mentioned that we can have uh, uh, changes in precipitation. This can increase drought, water stress, uh, we've seen in the uh, northwest of the, the U.S. a uh, tremendous number of wildfires. This is releasing a lot of particulate matter and causing uh, uh, quite considerable distress uh, and uh, with respect to respiratory disease. Um, ozone levels are very sensitive to temperature, as I mentioned, and this can increase outdoor ozone levels. Some of that will penetrate indoors, but ozone is also very interesting because it breaks down uh, many plastic type materials or elastomers and can cause deterioration and, and problems there as well. And the third example is pollen, and we see an increase in many areas of allergenic pollens and this may uh, reflect uh, disturbances to soils and fields. We also see a change in the use of pesticides to deal with vectors, uh, pests that are um, changing their geographic range due to um, the warming. And this can cause greater levels of pesticide use and exposure as well. So these are a few examples of the effects of climate change on both indoor and outdoor pollutants. I'd like to now introduce uh, my colleague and Dean, uh, John Overpeck. Hi, thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little more about climate change and uh, air pollution, all types of pollution and our health. Uh, what I want to talk about today uh, is just a subset, of course, of of the mother all, of all environmental challenges, climate change. Uh, it's something that's going on. Uh, it's very clear. We know why it's occurring. We know how to stop it. Um, but I really wanted to ensure uh, that we got a sense of what it means for Michigan. And what I'd like to do is talk about it in a slightly different way than you've probably heard uh, others speak about it. Um, I wanna talk about the opportunity um, I want to talk about the challenge, which is usually what you hear when you hear from a climate scientist like me. Uh, and I want to talk about the reasons I have hope, because I think a lot of people, especially right now, with all the things going on, are losing a bit of hope, uh, particularly with respect to uh, climate change. This is a study I'm showing a map of the United uh, Lower 48, uh, produced by colleagues. And um, it shows estimated hits to the economy or to county level gross domestic product around the nation due to climate change. And what, it's, what these uh, investigators did is they, they looked at a range of uh, factors that are affected by a warming and drying or whatever climate. It includes sea level rise. It includes uh, changes to agriculture, crime, uh, coastal storms, you, uh, <laughs> this is a good year for talking about that. Uh, we're getting more stronger storms intensifying and raining a lot harder than we used to. These are the hurricanes. Uh, impacts on energy, human mortality, just getting so darn hot that that's increasing the amount of uh, mortality or death of humans. Uh, and labor, uh, a lot of people have to work outside. I just moved from Tucson, Arizona. In summer, you don't work outside unless you're really uh, risking it. Um, and the thing to realize is that these impacts in the United States are not evenly distributed. Uh, they are distributed uh, 
in red, uh, much more in the southeast and the southern tier than they are in the northern tier. So really there's an opportunity here in the sense that um, why would people move to Michigan? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the answer is pretty obvious. We're in a cooler part of the country. Uh, and so the impacts of extreme heat are going to be less. Uh, but we also have uh, a large percentage of the world's unfrozen water. And I think it's about 80% of our water in the United States is in the Great Lakes. Um, but this is a huge resource, as you'll see in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, so it's, people will wanna move here. But the thing is, is that Michigan could also become a sacrifice area in the face of climate change if we're not careful. So in other words, the impacts will be less here and they are less now than they are in many parts of the country, but they will start to accumulate in ways that will make even Michigan a difficult place. For example, uh, we have already warmed significantly in Michigan, about uh, two degrees Fahrenheit, but we could warm six times that by the end of the century. And what that translates to that I think most people can uh, relate to, whether you're in uh, the cities of the East or in Michigan, is that means uh, 40 or more days in a year uh, above 100 degrees if we let this climate change continue as it's continuing. And, you know, this is not a dry heat like in Arizona where I came from, uh, where you can tolerate 100 degrees in summer. This is, this is brutal, humid heat that is all day, all night long, uh, very distressing to uh, human health and activities. But there are a lot of other things that come with climate change. We've already talked, Stuart in particular, talking about how it affects aridity. Um, because the atmosphere as it warms can hold more moisture, that means uh, when there are droughts, they are drier, they are hotter, they are more severe, and they are longer. And you're seeing that out west where we have our first U.S. mega drought in recorded history um, in the southwest uh, going on now for over 20 years. And the uh, lifeblood of the southwest, the Colorado Rio Grande, uh, these are drying up, are literally the flows are declining in many of the other rivers as well. Out here, you're still going to see when you have your midsummer dry spells, they're going to be a lot more impactful. And that's why we're seeing uh, farmers go to irrigated ag uh, so they can get around that. Conversely, as that atmosphere holds more moisture, it also can rain more and harder in some places. So in Michigan, we've seen a sizable uptick in the amount of rainfall already, over a 10% increase in the mean or average amount of rainfall. It's a wetter state now than it used to be. But what's really surprising is how much the, the intensity of that rainfall has increased. Just like hurricanes, you're getting a lot more intense rainfall now. This is happening around the world. Uh, the odds are that you'll have much more intense precipitation. And the, uh, we've seen a 40% increase in rainfalling in the heaviest 1% of the events. So this is leading to uh, overwhelming of our uh, water, sewage water, uh, river dam infrastructure. Uh, we're seeing impacts there. We're seeing it on farm fields uh, where farmers are having trouble planting as they used to in the spring because of too much water coming too fast. And we're seeing it in our Great Lakes where it's causing a lot more runoff of nutrient-rich um, water from farmland into our Great Lakes. And Lake Erie here you can see is a, that green stuff. That is a algal bloom, but it turns out that's a harmful toxic algae uh, that is um, becoming more and more common as the lake warms and as more nutrients wash into the lake. And we now know, thanks to work at the University of Michigan, that these harmful algal uh, bloom uh, organisms actually get entrained in the air and are now blowing inland, whereas you don't even have to go in the water to get uh, sick, theoretically. Okay, and this could happen in all our Great Lakes. Um, and uh, you're also likely to start seeing things like the wildfire that you see out west with the drought. So it's, a, it's really just more extremes as much as it's more warming. So what's the reason for hope? I mean, Michigan could really be in a pile of hurt just like the rest of the country. And the most recent estimates are even more than Eva cited in her talk. 
they're in the tens of trillions of dollars, uh, the costs that will accumulate for the nation. Um, and what's interesting is there's a lot of reason for hope. And I think it's really important to realize this. First and foremost, one of the co-benefits of stopping climate change and uh, which means stopping the use of fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels, is that we will eliminate this air pollution, the particulate air pollution and the ozone will largely be eliminated if we just stop burning fossil fuels. So we solve climate change and all of a sudden we have much cleaner air. And this map just shows where the air, the air pollution is worst in the United States. And you can see in Southern Michigan, it's not a pretty picture. But we're also talking about well-paying clean tech jobs for the global market. We know what the solutions are. Renewable energy is one, storage with batteries and other things, uh, electrified mobility. There are a whole range of technologies that we already have in place. And like your big screen TV that you uh, old, you know, as recently as 15 years ago and now can easily afford, the price of all of these technologies continues to go down. And that means cheaper energy for everyone. Um, no more climate change. We get rid of all the threats I've talked about. No more air pollution. We get rid of what's on this map. And if we do this right, which it should be our goal everywhere, but certainly is in Michigan, it, we create opportunity and justice for all, not just a selected few. We get rid of those factories in um, communities of color uh, and where people don't have the power to say no. So I think the future could be very bright for Michigan and the United States if we tackle climate change and conversely, if we decide not to, it could be uh, a real disaster. And so I hope you all vote. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists. It's 2.30 and we're very cognizant of everyone's time. So uh, for those individuals who joined us on our 2 to 2.30 webinar, uh, please feel free to drop off. If there are individuals who um, can stay on, we will answer questions for uh, 10 minutes. So at this point, I'd like to uh, begin addressing the questions. And I think the first question will just go to you, uh, Dean Overpeck. Um, and I should also tell the audience that we had about 40 questions sent to us prior to the webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and address those. But if you emailed or sent a question, you will be emailed back with the answer. And our goal is also to send everyone who has attended the webinar a brief summary of the answers to our forming questions. But anyway, uh, Dean Overpeck, does the University of Michigan Ann Arbor have a plan and policy uh, to reach energy independence within the next 10 to 20 years? And what is U of M doing to reduce its carbon footprint? Well, that's a very timely question. Uh, as many of you might know, uh, President Mark Slissel has committed the University of Michigan to carbon neutrality, meaning to reduce our carbon footprint to zero. And that is not just for the Ann Arbor campus, but it's also for Dearborn and Flint. Um, when will we do that by is still uh, one of the big questions. How will we do it uh, is coming into focus. Uh, there is a commission that uh, President Slissel empowered to provide the answers. We've spent quite, and I'm on that commission, we've uh, spent a lot of time with uh, faculty and student analysis teams as well as hiring outside teams. And we're confident that we'll be able to do this in the coming uh, decade or two. Um, and we will uh, be doing this at the same time that uh, Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, a number of communities in Michigan are also committed to carbon zero uh, neutrality, as well as the state of Michigan. You probably saw that Governor Whitmer also recently in the last two weeks has committed the state to carbon neutrality. So this state is going to be a leader. It's going to be in the heartland of the United States in uh, going to a carbon neutral uh, state. And of course, we'll get those other co-benefits that I, I uh, noted, including much better health for our citizens. 
And so the next question I'll address is uh, to Dr. Batterman. And so it's, it's an interesting one. So Dr. Batterman, the question is like, what percentage of global warming would naturally occur as natural versus how much of it is man-made? Can you walk us through that in a brief answer? Sure, um, it's a great question. Um, the Earth is continuously bathed in solar radiation coming from the sun. And I have to put out a couple of numbers. We get about 340 watts per square meter coming in every day on average. And the pre-industrial time, say in the 17th or 18th century, that was the balance. That radiation came in, some of it was reflected, some of it was kept in the atmosphere, some of it warmed the earth, and it gave us the temperature and the climate and the weather that we're used to. Now, since say 1950, and more recently with the greenhouse gases in particular, the long lived ones, we've added uh, to that formula of 340 coming in. Now we add more, about two or three more watts per square meter of what we call radiative forcing. So this means that the balance, instead of the same coming in, emitting that energy, keeping the temperature, we're increasing the load by a, a less than a percent right now. But the problem is that at the end of the century on a business's normal path, we will be adding a couple more percent of this radiative forcing, which disturbs the balance. And so that accounts for the climate change that we see. So, you know, one way to think of it is natural is maybe the most of it, but what we're adding to it is enough to tip the balance so that we end up with this climate change. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Galtman, this is a great question actually. What do we know about PFAS in our water supply and neurodegenerative diseases like ALS? And what testing would you recommend people do proactively to measure the toxins uh, in their system? Yeah, that is a good question. So. PFAS and PFOS are certainly widespread pollutants that I, I think much of the, the country is, is facing. Um, and the sources are, are numerous, um, including from things like food packaging. Um, we just don't know at this point what the effect is on neurodegenerative diseases. I, we don't have those data. It's certainly of, of interest. Um, and, and I think we, because this is such a widespread uh, exposure, I think we're going to need some of these studies to, to help us understand that. Um, even though, so in regards to the second question, you know, even though that we've shown these data that indicate that there are these pollutants in, in higher amounts in, in, in blood samples, we're not necessarily advocating that, that you go out and measure your blood. I think that's too early for us to, to say that there is a, um, that there's a special formula that, that, that you can, apply to the levels of pollutants in your blood. Um, we may get there. We're working on getting okay. there to really understand that. Good. But I think it's too soon right now. So we need okay. these, these studies to help us understand how these exposures um, are going to play out across ALS and other diseases. Okay, I will uh, answer uh, a question here that's directed to me. And uh, the question is, um, ALS runs in my family, according to the questioner is asking. Um, and is there anything I can do uh, in terms of the environment to prevent getting ALS? Well, it's a really good question also. So we believe and are doing a lot of research here at Michigan Medicine, Dr. Galvin, Dr. Batterman and myself, trying to look at ALS prevention. And so while we know ALS won't be completely a preventable disease, we do think that there is clear genetic risk, but this genetic risk can be somewhat offset by doing preventative measures. That's one of the reasons we are so interested in the environment. So we do, uh, we do advocate what I'll say is kind of clean, green living, uh, as has been discussed uh, in, in today's webinar. And we'd be really happy to speak with you more uh, on that topic. So, Everyone talks about ALS cure, but we are also at Michigan Medicine and our group very interested in what we call trying to prevent, talking about ALS prevention. 
So I think we have time for at least a couple more panelists to uh, address a few more questions. So we'll make the answer short. Uh, and to uh, you, Dean Overpeck, how would climate change affect emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19? Uh, well, there are multiple ways uh, climate change is gonna affect infectious disease. But one of the first things you gotta realize is that as the climate changes, both the temperature, the precipitation, and the, and the extremes, is that uh, plants and animals will move around in their favored habitats on the planet. And this means that, for example, infectious diseases that are normally constrained to the tropics uh, will be able to start moving into the extra tropics uh, and temperate locations like where we live. So for example, watch what's happening with Lyme disease. It's now moving pretty successfully further north in Michigan. Or think about dengue, which is down on the border with Texas and Mexico, uh, moving up north as the favored habitats for mosquitoes moves up north. That goes with other infectious diseases with a long list of mosquito-borne diseases and others. The other thing that's happening is that uh, both land use by humans and climate change is affecting the size of a, a lot of habitats. And that's forcing um, and or is resulting in uh, humans uh, getting in uh, contact with more organisms uh, that normally they wouldn't have been. And so it's that interaction between humans right. and wildlife and plants that's leading to the transmission of some of these novel diseases into humans and of course creating havoc like uh, COVID is. Okay, uh, we're gonna do two last short questions with short answers, so we will end on time <laughs> for our audience. Uh, uh, Stuart, um, what is the effect of, or Dr. Batterman, excuse me, <laughs> what is the effect of wildfires on subsequent rainfall along the Pacific coastal ranges? Yeah, that's another good question too. So there's both short and long-term consequences. I think, you know, to speak about the short term, um, obviously there's change in the way the land use is gonna look in terms of the um, terrain being altered, what we call the albedo being offered. So in fact, the sun may heat up the ground more because you don't have that vegetation. Um, in terms of long-term, it's, uh, likely that there'll be differences. Um, we're going to see more of the extremes that Dr. Overpeck talked about, more dry periods, um, hot periods. This can exacerbate air pollution problems. And precipitation will also have these extremes too. While the amount of precipitation isn't expected to change that much in this region, it will come down with greater intensity in the winter and the droughts in the summer would likely be longer. So again, this has another negative effect, unfortunately, on air quality. Last question to Dr. Gautman. Uh, Dr. Gautman, can you share uh, information on cyanotoxins and ALS? Sure. There's, so, I, so Dean Overpeck showed a, a great figure of the algal blooms in, in Lake Erie and certainly mm -hmm. there is concern that these algal that these algae um, through toxins like the cyanotoxins can influence ALS and and there are some great groups around the country looking into this. We have an interest in this as well, given the number of inland lakes in Michigan, and I think it remains to be seen. It's a very plausible mechanism of, of ALS, and there's more work to be done. Okay, thank you so much. I'd like to thank my colleagues for joining me and for all of you for uh, listening to us. I hope you'll join us in January where our topic will be on brain health, uh, something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. Thank you so much and we look forward to hearing from you in the neural network for emerging therapies.